Welcome to Trench Diaries. Iron Coffins, Part 11. The month of August in 1941 was but a few days old when U-557 sailed for her second patrol. At 1400 we removed the lines from the pillars and the obligatory band played a march and a thunderous hurrah came from the commander of the flotilla as well as officers and enlisted men. At the far end of the quay stood the public, including a number of girls, who were waving tearful farewells to their lovers. The war had brought them together and now the war separated them again. U-557 sailed out of Lorient under electric power. When she had poor Louis on their left, the diesels began to mutter their old, intimate song. Half of the ship's company was standing on a cigarette deck or leaning against the railing, smoking, chatting and enjoying a last hour of sunshine. A stern, picturesque Lorient and the Brittany coast slowly diminished. As our escort vessel departed, her skipper shouted through the megaphone, Gute Reise und gute Jagd. A pleasant trip and good hunting. The men were ordered below. The watch and the captain remained on deck together with the newcomer who had embarked only 30 minutes before we put to sea. Captain Lieutenant Kelbling, a classmate of Paulsen, had been assigned to us as a prospective commanding officer. He had no special function. His only duty was to round out his experience with one war patrol. Later, we passed through a fleet of fishing boats lying lazily in the blazing sun. Their yellow, red and green sails pointed into the deep blue sky like colored sugar cones. As we approached the last of the trawlers, Paulson ordered quickly, Both ahead full. Set course 270. After the continent had sunk into the sea, U-557 submerged for her first trim dive. For three days we saw no enemy plane or smoke cloud. The Bay of Biscay was calm and deserted. When U-557 passed the 8th longitude west, Paulson opened the sealed envelope he had received from Admiral Dönitz. Our orders were to attack the convoy routes in the North Channel between Ireland and Scotland. Headquarters expected a heavy concentration of enemy shipping in that area. The envelope also contained details of the minefields near the channel. U-557 took on a northwesterly course. The diesels roared the symphony that made every man's heart beat faster. The next morning, at 0700 sharp, the men off duty were awakened by a blaring loudspeaker. This was not the first time that phonograph music had heralded a new day aboard, but it was the first time that a British song was played. Everyone recognized the wishful lyrics, put on a broad smile and hummed with the British in chorus. The British, far from being able to take our famous defensive line, had abandoned the record in Lorient, along with uniforms and war material, when they fled through France before our advancing troops in 1940. On the sixth day of our patrol we sliced into a critical area, 120 miles southwest of Fasnet Rock, the lighthouse on the southernmost tip of Ireland. Here, the southern convoy routes converged to a narrow path not more than 80 miles wide. We made no contact, however, and continued on a circular course approximately 250 miles west of the Irish coast to avoid detection by the British aircraft. Eventually, we arrived at the 58th parallel, made a sharp turn to starboard and went on an eastbound course toward the North Channel. Ten days after departing the French paradise, we reached a spot three miles northwest of the soaring cliffs of the island in Istrahul, which lay almost in the center of the shipping route. We tried to lurk there, for the island's lighthouse offered us an excellent navigational fix, but the strong current washing through the channel forced us back into the Atlantic. We cruised the area for several days without hearing a sound or spotting a ship. Obviously, the British had redirected their convoy traffic. The fruitless search began to affect the disposition of the crew. Paulson, frustrated, contacted Admiral U-Boats asking to be relocated into a better hunting grounds. The answer suggested that headquarters was receiving excellent intelligence from Nova Scotia. It said, Proceed into AL69. Halifax convoy expected. General course east northeast 11 knots. Light defense. Good hunting. We raced westward at a high speed for three days. When we arrived at our designated position, it was night and the Black Sea breathed gently. The U557 stopped her engines and the sounding operator began his watch. However, we spent the night without spotting the enemy. 
With the first morning rays, we resumed our chase and crossed the square in irregular patterns. At 15.10 the same afternoon, as I was plotting course at the small table in the control room, a man on the bridge shouted, Smoke cloud, bearing 300! The captain dashed past me and leaped to the top. I heard him hollering at the man in unmistakable anger. You call that a smoke cloud? It's a damn forest fire! Crew to battle stations! When I reached my place on the bridge, U557 had turned toward the black smudge. As we approached, the cloud expanded into a broad black curtain of dense smoke and fumes. Then we spotted the mastheads and stacks of the zigzagging destroyers preceding the armada. Five minutes later a forest of masts crept over the sharp edge of the horizon. We were on collision course with a huge convoy. Half an hour later the parade of ships had not yet appeared in the eye of the periscope. Paulson relied solely upon the report from the sounding room. The crew moved quietly on action stations. The torpedo gang flooded the tubes and the second mate adjusted the torpedo data computer. I myself took the helm. Another half hour later the sounding gear picked up two destroyers, their propellers whirring at high revolutions. Both hunters made their moves as if not quite sure in which direction to search for the silent enemy. Asdic impulses began to bounce against our hull. The noise mounted in volume and density, the hammering of piston engines, the thrashing of propellers and the knocking and rumbling of many approaching vessels reached a fierce crescendo. The XO had calculated the convoy's speed and course, the rest was up to Paulson. And he swung his boat into attack position, his hands were busy adjusting the scope to the ups and downs of the sea, training the crosshairs on the fattest targets. He kept turning, extending and retracting the scope, watching the cargo ships approach in an orderly fashion. There, they swayed in a sluggish sea, innocently carried away to their destruction. Within a minute, this respectable parade of 45 rocking giants would be disrupted by fiery breaking ships and the rest of the vessels would spurt away, their crews terrified by the horror of devastation. Another 30 minutes later, death charges detonated close by, three heavy explosions. Paulson jokingly insisted that they were at least 1000 meters away. The cook meanwhile distributed coffee and some sandwiches. There was too much salami on mine. The sweating torpedo gangers tended to their fish, while the diesel stokers oiled their engines. The chief balanced the boat like a juggler. While the captain sat at the scope watching the convoy flee toward the southern tip of Ireland. Three hours later we surfaced. Only a very thin line in the west indicated that the day had come to an end. Darkness hindered our sight, but the convoy could not run away. We were too close to its heels. Only a very thin light line in the west indicated that this day had come to an end. Darkness hindered our sight, but the convoy could not run away. We were too close to its heels and with both engines ahead full we pursued the herd. We sent a message to headquarters which said Convoy Grid Square AM71, course 125. I am in pursuit. Shortly after midnight we dived to take a sounding. The operator reported propeller noise bearing 300 to 360, estimated distance 10 miles. 10 minutes later U557 surged back to the surface and once again the song of the engines together with the swishing noise of the sea rushing alongside the hull produced a hymn which accompanied us into battle. Suddenly a white flare fell in the east. It was a destroyer about 3000 meters to port. We drew a big loop around this escort swinging into the convoy's wake. It was as if we drove into nowhere. Sky and sea formed a solid black wall. It soon became apparent, however, that the convoy made drastic changes of course. We continued eastward for two hours in a huge zigzag pattern, but detected no convoy. It was almost 2 a.m. when a shadow moved into my glasses. Then there were two, three and four. Paulson saw them and the XO saw them too. Two escorts flitted nervously at the tail of the starboard column and one zigzagged ahead of our boat, all of them completely unaware of our breakthrough. Huge shadows, giant cargo ships pitched about unperturbed, their broad flanks inviting a shot. U557 gradually swung into attack position. An escort broke toward us through the wall of darkness, but we eluded her by sneaking close to a huge freighter. Paulson pushed into the herd from astern. No enemy eye could spot our boat in the high windswept whirlpool close to the freighters. As Paulson steered tenaciously in between two columns, the fat shadows grew monstrous. The captain shouted into the raging storm, Exo, pick your targets, make it quick. We only get one shot at this. The Exo replied, I have them all on a string. Tubes 1 to 5, ready. 
Hard right rudder, Paulson screamed. Shoot, Exo! Seconds later, two torpedoes leapt out of their tubes. Then there was breathless waiting. Two hard explosions bellowed into the night. The volcanoes erupted almost simultaneously and two sharp shocks rocked the boat. Dozens of star shells climbed into the sky and countless parachute flares hung in the clouds, illuminating the wild seascape with a ghastly green and yellow glare. We had long since escaped the scene of disaster when two escorts arrived to rescue survivors. The impact upon the enemy was so severe, the confusion so great, that no serious counteraction followed. As a result, we risked staying on the surface to reload the tubes. We clung to the convoy, carefully holding our distance behind the shadows. The stricken convoy had made a sharp turn to the north, but the wolf was still within the flock. Some distance to the south, two vessels lost their struggle and the last flickering flames were swallowed by the violent sea. During those moments between life and death, I pictured the seamen on their doomed vessels, riding the huge waves holding onto life rafts. I felt sorry for those courageous men who had to suffer and go down with their ship. It was a terrible ending of a hopeless struggle. I could understand why the British seamen persisted, they were fighting for the very existence of their country. But I was bewildered by the stubbornness of the captains and crews from foreign lands. Why did they continue sailing for the British, defying our torpedoes and the growing ferocity of the battles? Whatever price the British had paid for their services, it could never have been enough to compensate for their risks and very lives. I was astounded that His Majesty's Admiralty was still able to recruit any number of foreign ships. As the impenetrable darkness settled once again over the water desert, we encountered the convoy anew. As always before an attack, we felt a mixture of excitement and perhaps a little fear rising within us. Soon, the foggy and murky night limited our visibility once again. Then, we saw the ghostly vehicles of the distant and close escorts of the convoy crossing our wake at high speed. Once again, we infiltrated the group of steamers unnoticed. Three or four freighters took on distinct shapes on the starboard side, all within excellent firing range. A quick command, a hard maneuver by the helmsman and then Paulson's call. Shoot, XO, I can't hold this course much longer. Can frantically rotated his Uzo. His targeting line was constantly being interrupted by the high waves. For God's sake, XO, let the fish go. The captain hurled his order in Can's face. The Exo, his hands clenched around the steel base of the Uzo, his forehead pressed against the rubber cushion of the night binoculars, took aim and then shouted the decisive command and pressed the firing lever twice. It was 1.34 am. U557 turned away sharply. Then an explosion. A hit. One of the steamers broke apart just aft of the bridge. The new victim heeled to starboard, a burst of flames shot briefly from the chimney and then its deck slowly sank into the water. The storm carried the stench of explosions, the biting smell of burning cargo and the smoke clouds of coal-fired boilers over to us. Carried by towering waves, U557 raced towards its next target. While retreating, we kept our last victim in the lenses of our powerful binoculars. In the devilishly flickering light of star shells, we saw that the steamer showed no sign of sinking. Decisively, Paulson turned his boat around and made a second approach towards the motionless giant. U557 quickly closed the distance and Cairn the XO targeted the 6000 tonner. The fish was let go at full speed and the ship immediately sank beneath the terrible impact. Its stern rose steeply and its propellers spun in its final throws. Immediately, defensive measures were taken. Long burning star shells shot into the night sky. Their light was so bright that I could count the beard stubbles on the commander's face. Not far to our port side, the dying ship broke apart. Skillfully maneuvering this boat through the columns, Paulson pushed forward into the dark part of the parade. The star shells had attracted a destroyer. He came alongside the sinking ship and started rescuing survivors. It was a tempting, easy target, however, an unwritten law forbade Paulson from attacking ships engaged in rescue operations. So he broke into the herd once more. This battle was his battle. He alone dictated the terms and after 20 minutes he managed to break into the middle of the group. An enormous vessel of about 5000 tons became his next victim. I heard a command amid the raging howl of the storm and then I felt the shot break. The torpedo hissed away. The time was 2.05 am. U557 broke away from the convoy and sailed eastward at full speed. The torpedo hit. 
A burst of flame behind the bridge, soaring into the sky, and then an explosion. The freighter, 5000 tons, broke apart with a sudden jolt. Then the nighttime darkness enveloped the drama of sinking. SU-557 escaped at full speed from the scattered convoy and disappeared into the darkness, the two parts of the steamer gurgled into the depths. With a mixture of astonishment, silent horror and satisfaction, we registered a new sinking, our third that night. U-557 moved away to reload the torpedoes. The boat rolled in respectful distance from the convoy in the heavy seas. For over an hour we staggered awkwardly at the edge of visibility until all tubes were reloaded. Then we set out for a new pursuit. U-557 cautiously closed the distance to the convoy and once again tore the formation from the stern. Like a wedge the boat penetrated the convoy. Two freighters groaned ponderously through the nighttime haze on a straight course. Unbelievably, we remained undetected. Take down the two big ones, XO, barked Paulson with a dripping face. U-557 swung in a wide arc, shook under the hard impact of the crossing seas and steered again into firing position. Then I heard a bone-chilling report. Destroyer bearing 220 degrees, angle on bow zero. The large ship suddenly appeared, its bow emerged razor sharp from the darkness. Paulson leaned over the hatch and called into the boat. Chief, get everything out of the engines or someone will bite us in the ass. That was the chief's signal. The diesel engines roared and U-557 leapt forward. Paulson squeezed the boat between two freighters, but the pursuer stuck to our tail just 200 meters behind. With this destroyer in pursuit, I think this is a good moment to end this episode. And I have to say, honestly, the English translation is starting to become really frustrating. Um, in this specific part, there are entire pages that are completely fictional and at least six entire pages that are completely missing. Furthermore, other parts are entirely out of sequence. So events that happen on previous days suddenly are happening on their way back to um, Lorient, which doesn't make sense. But Enough of this. Um, what you heard and what you will continue to hear is as close to the German original as possible. I have translated the missing parts myself and put the events in the correct order. I have also skipped, of course, the fictional events. Um, I will get in contact with the publishing company and get to the bottom of this, I promise. But um, right now, let me tell you, this episode in particular has been very difficult to edit and I hope it won't continue to be as bad for the rest of the book. Anyway, concerning the historical context, um, what Herbert describes here is his second war patrol, but U-557 actually went out to sea before. Uh, however, um, they had to return after just one day at sea because both diesel engines were having problems. The captain describes this in the war diary and presumes that either one or both cylinder heads had cracked or that some cylinder liners were beginning to break. So they returned to Lorient, had both diesel engines repaired and went out again after five days in dry dock. Um, interestingly, while going back for repairs, the captain takes note that he put the boat on the bottom for four hours while waiting for the minesweeper to escort him back into port. I guess this makes sense because on the surface around the um, Lorient area and the Bay of Biscay, it would have been too dangerous just to be a sitting duck, so to say. So, that was it for this episode. Again, you know the drill. Thank you for watching. Like, comment, subscribe for more videos. And I appreciate it immensely. Cheers.